I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon, and today is the sixth day in our novena to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We continue then with the book of the Sacred Heart and the Priesthood by Mother Louise Margaret Claret de La Touche, a visitation nun who died in the year 1915, and the English translation of this book was published uh, in 1950 and is currently reprinted and, re and published by Tan Books. Now, uh, Mother Margaret Louise points out that the Lord confided to the priest four great functions corresponding to the four great needs of the human creature. Firstly, the man is profoundly ignorant and the priest teaches. Secondly, the man is a sinner and the priest absolves. Thirdly, the man is unfortunate, but the priest is the consoler. This is where we go today. Man is unfortunate, but the priest is the consoler. Banished from heaven, he passes his days on earth in labor and sorrow. Suffering presses upon him from every side. Today his body is broken by sickness. Tomorrow his heart is rent by treachery or the loss of loved ones. And how often is his soul shaken by fear, remorse, or doubt? But the priest is the consoler. He makes man hope. He makes known to souls the value of suffering. He makes man hope for an eternity of happiness in return for passing sorrow. He opens the abysses of infinite love to afflicted and abandoned hearts. He raises up despairing souls by revealing to them the divine mercies and spreading light and love over the earth. He consoles all sorrow and dispels all fear. Now let us turn then to chapter 4 on Jesus consoling. We're going to skip through to the 11th lecture, Jesus consoling the people. And this is reminiscent of of yesterday's video where we heard about uh, St. Mary Magdalene, Zacchaeus, the Samaritan woman, and so forth. So today we revisit our Lord in the gospel and he's consoling the people. Yesterday we were considering him pardoning the people. Today he is consoling the people. Let us now with the aid of the gospels follow Jesus in his mission of consoler. For during the three years of his public life, he does not rest content with purifying sinful souls by his sublime pardons. He passes as a most sweet consoler in the midst of human miseries, healing suffering bodies, binding up the wounds of sorrowing hearts, pouring out into souls his peace, that peace which surpasseth all understanding and appeases all sorrow. At the commencement of his ministry, he begins by transforming our ideas of sorrow. Before his coming, suffering had been a humiliation, and sorrow a shame. A sick body was an object of horror. The groaning of broken hearts found no echo. But when on the mountain, the powerful voice of the Master uttered that cry, Blessed are the poor! Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that suffer. The human soul learned the value of suffering. Is it not a consolation to know the inestimable value of suffering, to know what it expiates, what it obtains, what it merits, to know the immense weight of glory that a few days of suffering endured on earth will merit for all eternity. And what a supernatural and sublime consolation. It braces hearts for noble enterprises. It fortifies wills that are naturally weak in the face of sorrow. It multiplies courage tenfold by giving a glimpse of the immortal recompense. In order to show us how estimable sorrow is, Jesus took it as his lot and he chose it in preference to all the joys of this earth here below. As we have seen, he subjected his human nature to the experience of all kinds of sufferings to which our poor human nature is heir. 
he made himself poor to console the poor. He consented to be rejected and humiliated in order to console those whom the world rejects and persecutes. He suffered voluntarily in his whole physical and moral being in order that we might find him near to us in each of our sorrows. His pity for the sick is profound. He cannot hear their complaints without his sacred heart being moved, and we see him all eagerness to relieve them and heal their infirmities. It is in their favor that he is pleased to exercise his divine power. He drives no one away, however lowly or miserable or repulsive he may be. All those who have sick suffering from diverse diseases, bring them to Jesus. But he, laying his hands on every one of them, healed them. So we hear from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. He goes tirelessly, tirelessly from place to place to those who have need of his help. And what sweetness in his words. With what delicate art does he not say the right words to those who press around him? With a heart full of compassion, he listens to the humble prayer of the officer from Capernaum, who scarcely dares to entreat the master for the cure of his sick son. In, he, in haste to give consolation to this father plunged in sorrow, he says to him simply, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And to the man sick of the palsy brought to him to be cured, he, who was brooding sorrowfully over a sinful past, he says, be of good heart, son. Thy sons are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven thee. The cure of his body would not have sufficed to console him who was suffering also from the remembrance of his sins. It was first necessary to soothe the, men, the mental pain of the sufferer by granting him pardon. One day in a crowd, the master, by his divine knowledge, perceived a great object of pity. A woman was endeavoring to approach him for she said to herself, If I shall touch only his garment, I shall be healed. Jesus, filled with compassion, allowed divine virtue to go out from him, and behold, the poor woman became aware that she was cured. Troubled at what she had dared to do, and still more so by the looks of those who surrounded her, she remained motionless and confused. But Jesus, in the excessive goodness of his heart, found consoling words, Be of good heart, daughter. Thy faith hath made thee whole. It was faith that brought this woman into the midst of the crowd. The master, who reads the hearts of all, knew it. And by these few words, Thy faith hath made thee whole. He consoled her, for the painful efforts which she has had to make in order to approach him, and for the prolonged waiting that she endured in the hope of meeting her Savior. Another time, Jesus visited the probatic pool. Numerous sick people were gathering at this place, waiting for the miraculous movement of the water. Among them, the keen eye of the divine consoler perceived a poor sick man with sad and dejected countenance. This man asked for nothing. He did not implore the master to be cured or ask for an alms. He did not know that Christ had the power to restore him to health. The heart of Jesus guided him toward this mute object of compassion, and addressing the paralytic, he said to him, Wilt thou be made whole? He, the divine consoler, went down over this afflicted one, over this man, who has no one to aid or succor him, cured his malady and brought joy to his heart. When the master meets with hearts broken by the death of beloved ones, how he shares their sorrow, how he hastens to make use of his omnipotence to restore to them the objects of their affection. Jairus is plunged in despair. His only daughter is dying. She dies. His grief is so profound that he can scarcely believe that the master is powerful enough to restore to him his child. He sends for him, however, and Jesus goes, for he is in haste to console this afflicted father. Fear not, he says to him, full of sympathy. Believe only, 
and she shall be safe. The child restored to life is given back to the grief-stricken parents. But this does not suffice for the tender heart of Jesus. He wishes that they may have the joy not only of seeing their daughter alive, but also fully restored to health and strength. And he bid them give her to eat. And the gospel adds that her parents were astonished. In the course of their journeys, the master comes to the city of Naim, and on entering the city, he perceives a mother in mourning, following the lifeless body of her only son. Moved by this mother's sorrow, he pours consolation into her broken heart. Weep not, he says to her. And the young man, brought back to life by the all-powerful word of the master, is restored to his mother. Lazarus has just died. Jesus, who loved him as a faithful friend, is saddened by his death. He is saddened still more, perhaps, on account of Martha and Magdalene, who he knows are overwhelmed by the weight of their sorrow. He feels himself urged to go and console them. He takes the road toward Judea in spite of the prudent warnings of those who wish to dissuade him from returning there. Arrived at Bethany, he meets Martha and endeavors to console her troubled soul by reminding her of eternal life and of the eternal reunion. Magdalene, in her turn, receives supernatural consolations, but the converted sinner is in a state of mind that refuses all relief. Jesus trembles in face of such profound sorrow. He himself weeps with the inconsolable sisters of Lazarus. He goes to the sepulcher and, turning to his heavenly Father, he prays him to hear him again. Father, I give thee thanks that thou hast heard me. I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people who stand about have I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And after these words, he cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately this man, who has been dead, comes forth, his hands and feet bound with the grave cloths, and his head wrapped around with a napkin. Loose him and let him go, said the Savior. The priest sent by Jesus is, like him, often called to console those who suffer from infirmity and sickness, to raise up hearts crushed by sorrowful separation. If he cannot, like his divine master, cure and resuscitate the body, he can, by the grace of Christ who speaks by his mouth, bring comfort to many sorrows and dry many tears. What a beautiful and consoling part of the ministry of a priest is the visiting of the sick. He ought to make it his sweetest recreation to go to these living images of the crucified Savior with all the tenderness of his heart. He can so easily lessen the intensity of their suffering by pointing out to them its value and by directing their thoughts toward the hope of eternal happiness. Let the priest then use great prudence and most delicate charity in raising up those souls toward God in order to make them understand the nothingness of the goods of this world and the illusion of vain friendships. When the body suffers, the soul is is so easily brought near to God. But in the consolations which he gives, let him be always supernatural, and let his words, like those of Jesus, be all full of confidence and hope. Faith in the divine promises and confidence in the infinitely merciful love of Jesus Christ, that is what the priest should give as the best and solidest of consolations to those whom sickness keeps on the bed of pain and to those who weep by the coffins of their dear ones. And we will stop there for today. We'll continue with more tomorrow. But now let us pray our Novena prayer, and you can find a link in the description below this video for another video where we pray along with this Novena prayer, and you can pray that every day. It is said, and I believe it, that St. Padre Pio prayed the Novena to the Sacred Heart every day for 50 years. So you're not just limited to the nine days of this Novena. You can pray that prayer any day. Now, 
Let's see, what else? Oh yes, there's also a printout of the Novena Prayer, and you can find a link to the Mothers for Priests website uh, in the description below this video. And there they also have uh, many, many different prayer pamphlets. It's, it's a really neat website. Those are the prayer pamphlets, many of which that I print out and put out here in the narthex at the church. There's also an apostolate associated with that called Mothers for Priests, and if you are a mother, then uh, you may uh, like to take a look at that, uh, at that apostolate, Mothers Who Pray for Priests. Well, that's it for today. Join me tomorrow for Day 7 in the Novena to the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, and don't miss a day of prayer with us.